Hey guys, just wanted to do this video tutorial on pitchforks. Now, as you will all know, pitchforks are a huge element to my trading strategy. I essentially like to combine pitchforks with Elliott Wave. So essentially, most people are aware that pitchforks are demonstrating trend. And obviously, if we're demonstrating trend, then it's also going to define the loss of trend also. But the thing that I think most people overlook is the third piece of information that pitchforks are giving us, which is this bit, which is momentum. We can actually determine a lot about momentum and I think this is often overlooked because with momentum, we can actually identify where trend is likely to be lost before it actually happens. So it's giving us that kind of early warning signal. So let's go into what pitchforks are all about. So how are they drawn first of all? Let's take a, a pitchfork and essentially you're just drawing three points of data and from there, your pitchfork lines are extrapolated. First point we're gonna put here, second point, third point. You can see once you've clicked the third time, you've got your third pivot in, you get your pitchfork lines drawn out for you. So it's three data points, this low, this high, and this low. And then you get your data lines. There are different types of pitchforks, which we will be going into. But um, yeah, for now, this is all we need to focus on. Three pivots will determine your pitchfork lines. So the choice of these pivot points are absolutely crucial. This is the information that is going in. And if you alter these points at all, it's going to affect your lines. That's going to affect your support and resistance. It's going to affect where loss of trend is defined. So it's so important you get these points accurately placed. And obviously, if you're just putting them however you want, then of course, the resultant lines are going to change. And eventually, if you wanted, you could put plot something that supports what your bias is. That's why you've got to plot these pivots following strict rules. Otherwise, you know, you're just plotting what you want to see rather than what is an objective analysis of the, of the chart. So here, just to let you know, we're looking at the Dow Jones. We're on the monthly time frame. This goes all the way back to the Great Depression. So you can see how this pitchfork has monitored the trend throughout this whole time for the last 90 years. So this is a shift pitchfork. We'll go into, as I say, we'll go into details about the different pitchforks later on. And we're on the log scale. That's the other important thing you need to remember, okay? The scale, whether it's log or linear, is very important. I always have the log scale uh, on my charts. The choice of pivots is very important. So how do you choose your pivots? Well, the first one is, is quite clear, okay? So it's a major swing low, or if you're looking at a downward trend, it's gonna be a swing high, okay? So it's your genesis point is, is quite well defined. Now, I generally look at it from an Elliott wave point of view. I look at the first wave up to have completed, and then I'll the, my second pivot will be the high, that, so the end of that first wave, okay? So once I see a nice impulse five waves in, if I'm looking at um, you know, I, an expectation for an impulsive move to the upside, I'll put that as my second pivot. And then my third pivot will be the subsequent second wave. Now, if you don't like Elliott Wave, then you, you're, not, you're not completely reliant on Elliott Wave. You're, you're essentially using your low, your high, and then your higher low. And using those points, you will then get your pitch for. I like to use Elliott Wave because there can be a bit of ambiguity as to this final pivot. And just to demonstrate how that can come about, if we just draw an initial five wave move up, so one, two, three, four, five, and then we draw the second wave, which will be an ABC, and we'll do it as a running flat. So if we do an A, B, C. Okay, and I'm just gonna make this a bit bigger for better clarity. Okay, A, B, C. So the question is, where would your pivot points be for the pitchfork? Would it, so the first one's obvious, it's right at the major swing low, so here, and the second pivot, well, you can argue it's not obvious because is it here or is it here? Now, from an Elliott Wave point of view, you know that it's after five waves, the first wave. And then where is your third pivot? Is it here or is it here? So as I say, I like to follow the Elliott Wave analysis and I would be putting my third pivot here. So I'm essentially using the waves to determine my pivot points. So I'm looking at the first wave up, which in the case of an impulse, we're using a one, two, three, four, five to determine the end of the uh, first wave, that's where I put my second pivot, and my third pivot will be at the end of the second wave. So once this correction is finished, which is here and not here, I'll put my third pivot. So as I say, as I've demonstrated, it's imp really important where you put your pivots. 
because it will determine the resultant lines. Now, this is the way I ap apply it, and I've been seeing you know, good results by using this, but I'm not gonna say that it's the only way to apply these pivots. You could very easily just look at the, you know, your major swing low, then look at the initial high put in, and then the subsequent low. So you could argue the third pivot is here. So it's, it's a little bit of trial and error. As I say, I've generally been finding better results when I use the Elliott Wave Analysis, but it's not a hard, fast rule. You can experiment with always applying your third pivot after the higher low has been put in. But whatever you, system you use, try and keep it consistent because otherwise you're just applying pitchforks uh, to suit your bias, all right? So that's the first important thing. I will often see people just kind of moving pitchfork lines to suit them. So the, the lines now, these are the important things. So what are these lines telling us? So essentially it's a regression tool. You're essentially getting the most important line here, which is red line, which runs through all of the trend. And a regression line basically means that as you deviate away from the median line, there's a tendency to return to the median line. And that tendency increases the further you move away from the median line. So let's say we come up to this line here, which we actually refer to as our upper median line. So there is obviously from that point a tendency to return back to the median line. And likewise, if you come down to the south side of the median line, to this lower median line, there's a tendency to return back to the median line. Now, if we were to go as far as the lower warning line, that tendency to return to the median line is even greater. Okay, and the same applies on the upside. If you come as high as the upper warning line, there is a great tendency to return to the median line. So the, the, the tendency increases, the tendency to return to the median line increases the further we get away from it, unless we break the trend. And we'll come to that in a moment. So just regarding the names of these lines, so median line is our middle one, the most important line. And then either side of that, we've got the upper median line, which is our blue line, lower median line just beneath it. And then on the outer aspects of the trend, we've got the upper warning line and the lower warning line. So I these are the ways I draw it. I like these dotted lines for our warning lines, blue line for our upper and lower median lines, and the median line in red. So as I say, this is essentially looking like a line of best fit. But that is only really seen as a line of best fit once kind of all the price points for the trend have been applied. Because let's say, for example, we've just had our first three pivots put in. We've then gravitated towards the median line. We could then come sideways for a while, perhaps as far as the lower warning line. And at that point, obviously, the median line is not really the line of best fit at that point. Okay, it's, it's above the majority of the data points. So it's only really at, once you've well into the trend that you would say that you've gone above and beneath the median line several times and it looks like a line of best fit, that regression line. So the point I'm trying to make here is early on in the trend, it won't necessarily be the line of best fit, but it will be the point at which price will gravitate towards. So let's talk a little bit about these lines. They're essentially support and resistance lines. So if you're beneath one of the lines, it will act as resistance. And if you're above it, it should then act as support. As soon as you, let's say for example, um, we've gone above the median line here, you would then look for it to act as support. So it again came back beneath the median line, there it's, it's resistance. And so getting back above it now acts as support and we go higher. So it depends on which side of the line you're on it, you expect it to act as support or resistance. Now, the upper and lower warning lines are very key in defining the trend. So at the upper warning line, as long as you're in an upward trend, if you're at the upper warning line, there's going to be a great tendency to collapse. There's a very high likelihood you're going to pull back. So for example, if I'm trading a long position, I would not want to hold it beyond the upper warning line. In fact, that would be a take profit level in my opinion. We'll often slightly overshoot it and sometimes grossly overshoot it but in terms of probability, there's a strong probability of returning back to the either upper median line or even the median line once you've hit your upper warning line, a very high probability. And especially if it's, it's hit that line after, you know, after coming up in a very fast manner. Okay, it means the price action is likely exhausted. It's a similar indication to an overbought RSI. 
that's essentially what it's telling you we're in an overbought territory okay and the same applies on the south side as, as when we approach the lower warning line we're in oversold territory so we're looking at a kind of bargain environment where we're looking at really good prices to look for further longs that's as long as we stay above this lower warning line because once we break it we'd say that the trend is broken so once a trend is broken you might as well delete the pitchfork because it's no longer reliable at all again you might see very slight deviations out of it which i can allow for for example you might see wicks of candles to the downside and i'm happy to allow for that but if we see pr closing high time frame candles outside of the lower warning line i'll get deeply concerned that the we're seeing a major reversal and a loss of trend and the good thing about the defined loss of trend using a pitchfork is that it will often tell you about the loss of trend before market structure is broken so you can see here we've got a major low here now let's say for example we just go sideways and eventually break this lower warning line that might happen before we take out this low so you're basically getting the warning that the trend is being lost before market structure has actually been lost. So it's another way of identifying a, a loss of trend before market structure is giving you that warning. And um, so yeah, these are the, the types of lines you've got. There's a tendency to return to the median line. I often like to use a, an elastic band analogy. So uh, if you can imagine the red line, the median line being your elastic band, and you're holding it taut from this being your one end and then the other end all the way at the other extremity and if you pull the elastic band from the middle and you pull it to here there'll be a, a slight tendency to return to median line but the tendency to return to the median line increases significantly if you pull it as far back as the lower warning line so that's essentially what you're seeing the tendency to return to median line increases the further you stretch this elastic band but obviously, essentially, the elastic band is broken if it goes beyond this lower warning line. That's in the case of an upward trend. Uh, in the case of a downward trend, if the elastic band goes as higher than the upper warning line, then that would be the loss of trend. All right, so this is the, the very basics with regards to pitchforks. These are the, the key things I want to show you. We'll, we will be going into a lot more detail, in particular, the different types of pitchforks but this is the very basics that I want you to be aware of, the nomenclature of the different lines within the pitchfork, how reliant these lines are on the exact precise plots of these pivot points. So this is so important and you need to have a system for how you apply these, otherwise you're essentially just applying your own bias to suit your agenda. And these, this is the information that you're extracting from the, the pitchfork. It's trend, loss of trend, and the thing that most people overlook is momentum. All right, so I think we'll wrap it up for this video. In the next video, we'll be going into a lot more detail on the different types of pitchforks.